All right, in this video, we are gonna start talking about motion and derivatives. So this is note three of Calc A and B. Uh, I will warn you that a lot of the stuff we talk about, it would be extremely useful if you had already done uh, my math analysis. Analysis. Uh, notes 22. So if you've talked about or done the material that's covered in those notes, uh, a lot of this will make a lot more sense to you. I'm going to try to go through it uh, in a way that kind of like reviews some of those concepts, but uh, I am sort of assuming that you already know that. So if that's what you're here for, uh, or if this is a little over your head at the moment, it won't be if you go watch the videos for those notes. So let's take a look. So motion and derivatives. So Derivatives, we know, tell us rates of change. It tells us the slope of a curve, slope of a tangent line. Um, so since they tell us rates of change, I think the most obvious thing to kind of like tell us is uh, how things are moving, right? So if we have a position function that tells us the position of a thing over time, so like at t equals zero, it's at, uh, I don't know, x equals six. At t equals five, it's at x equals one. Um, so we have a function that tells us position, the rate of change of position is important to know, right? That's the velocity. So uh, that's what we're gonna be looking at here. So to get started with, uh, we should know that we have to do a simplified version of this, right? So we're not gonna just have a curve in space. That would be crazy difficult at this point in our lives. So instead, we're just gonna focus on things that move in a straight line. Not just a straight line. We're gonna restrict ourselves to horizontal and vertical lines. Life's just easier that way, so we'll start there. If you're in Calc BC um, or Calc 2, you'll talk about uh, eventually things that move uh, along curves, right, using parametrics. Um, and then in Calc 3, you'll talk about things that are moving in space. So this is the very beginning, but we want to restrict ourselves to horizontal and vertical lines because it's just easier, right? So, you know, like kind of baby steps, I guess. So we are stuck with horizontal and vertical lines, usually actually just the x-axis and the y-axis. So a very common thing to do for position is to refer to it as S of T. So that, that's a, a, you're gonna see that all the time. So we have a thing that's moving back and a particle is usually what moves back and forth along a horizontal line with position S of T. Given by the equation, S of T is T squared minus four T plus three. And we wanna talk about the motion of the particle. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make a, a graph of the motion over time. So what's weird about this graph, and if you've done parametric equations, it's not actually that weird. T, the time, doesn't show up anywhere on the graph really. Um, and really what we have is we actually just have uh, this, right? So uh, maybe it starts here, it goes this way, then it goes back this way, then it goes this way, then it goes this way, then it goes this way. But you can't tell what's happening, right? So say I start at zero and I go to two, and then I go back to one, and then I go to four, and then I go back to three, and then I go to seven, and I go back to six. Can you tell from this that any of that happened? You can't. So what we're gonna do is uh, modify that a little bit. So first let's find the actual values. So I'm just gonna take these T values over here. So we're taking these T values and we're just gonna sub them in to S of T. Uh, so let's do that. So zero definitely gives me three. Uh, one gives me one minus four plus three, so that's zero. Two gives me four minus eight is negative four plus three is negative one. Um, three gives me nine minus 12 plus three, so that's zero again. Uh, four should give me three again by symmetry because of uh, we found symmetry between one and three, so uh, there should be symmetry at four too. So 16 minus 16 plus three is three. Uh, five is 25 minus 20 is five plus three is eight. And then six is 36 minus 24 is 12 plus three is 15. Okay, so now I know where this thing is at certain times. So I could try, I'm gonna try again. So at zero, I'm gonna be at three. Okay, at t equals one, I need to be at zero. At t equals two, negative one. Then I need to go back to zero. Then I need to go back to three. Then I need to go to eight. Then I need to go to 15. So that's like what the thing does. It basically goes like this and then like this. So you can watch it move, but it's really hard to get a sense of that if you're just looking at like, if I graphed that, it would just be basically a horizontal line. So here's what we do instead. 
at t equals zero, we're at three. So I'm just gonna put a point here, and I'll label it t equals zero. At t equals one, we're at zero. I'm gonna put a point here, label it as t equals one. Now, at t equals two is basically where you turn around. So what I'm gonna do is kind of move this up a little bit. So it takes planning when you create this graph. Um, and you know you just need experience to, to really like make that a thing you can do. So then we'll be here. So I'm trying to make it in such a way that nothing will overlap. And you, so the question we, one of the questions we wanna answer is like, how many of these points do I really need to plot? Do I need to plot all of them? Um, or can I kind of skip some of them? Like what are the most important points that I'm gonna plot? Uh, so we're all the way up here, t equals six. All right, so now the motion. I know that the motion of this thing is doing this, but that's meaningless when you just graph it. So instead what we do is this. We show that we move this way, then we turn around, then we go back this way, and we just kind of continue on. All right, so I could put arrows. I mean, I have all the times on here, so like it doesn't really need arrows at this point, but which of these were required, right? We plotted all of the points, but if I were gonna get this graph, which of the points would I have actually have needed? So I look at this thing and I think, well, um, I needed to know where to start. So I definitely need t equals zero. And then I just kind of like move to the left for a while. And then at t equals two, I stopped moving left and started moving right. So I actually really need that value. So I would need t equals two because that's kind of like the minimum value that I get. Um, that's when I change from moving to the left to moving to the right. And then I just move to the right until t equals six and eventually I, you know, I just seem to arbitrarily stop there. I guess it's just because we're between zero and six. If I were going to do this in the most efficient way, the only values that I would need are actually t equals zero, t equals two, and t equals six. So those are the only values I would need. If I could plot where it is at t equals zero, plot where it is at two, plot where it is at six, connect those, I would have gotten the same graph. So why are they important? Well, t equals zero and t equals six are their endpoints, right? They're where you start and they're where you stop. So maybe I should say that, start and stop. T equals two is the weirder point, right? T equals two is not obvious by just like looking at the table, but T equals two is a turning point. T equals two is important because you turn there. Uh, so turn there, yeah. Okay, so why do you turn there? You turn there because that's where you change from moving to the left to moving to the right. So that's actually, if you have a position function, the rate of change of position is called velocity. So we know that a function in general will change from increasing to decreasing, decreasing to increasing, where its derivative changes sign. The derivative of position is called velocity. So actually, what we found here at t equals two, uh, t equals two is actually where uh, velocity, so let me, velocity changes sign, right? So velocity is just a fancy name for the derivative of position. It's the rate of change of position. It's like, uh, it's like how fast you're going and in what direction. So it's actually a vector, right? It has a magnitude and a direction. It doesn't just have a magnitude. Um, so we change from moving to the left where I guess velocity would be negative um, to, change, to moving to the right where velocity would be positive. That happens at t equals two. So let's kind of look at some terminology that you may know, like if you've taken physics or if you, there's a really good chance that you know of these things without having taken physics or really having anyone discuss it with you. So we start off with position. So position uh, literally tells you where you are at a certain time. The rate of change of position is velocity. So, and we can use V of T for that. V of T therefore is the derivative of position, right? And so I don't really know why they decided this, but a couple of years ago, uh, the college board decided that if you wanna say that velocity, you wanna talk about velocity for a position function, you have to actually say 
v of t equals s prime of t. It's really annoying because like you have to know that, but uh, you got to know that. And then the rate of change of velocity is acceleration. So I would caution you when you talk about, uh, I would say like in, uh, in like normal life, you'll talk about something decelerating sometimes. Uh, we're going to avoid that. We're just going to say negative acceleration uh, rather than deceleration. But I, I know that like you talk about that in the real world. So we have position. The derivative of position, its rate of change is velocity. The derivative of velocity is the rate of change of velocity. I don't know what I'm saying there. Is acceleration. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. It's the second derivative of position. Um, so these are things you need to know. So rate of change of position is velocity. Rate of change of velocity is acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of position. Velocity is the first derivative of position. Velocity tells you the rate of change of position. Acceleration tells you the rate of change of velocity. So I know I just repeated myself like 10 times there, but that's important. All that information is super important. So I'm gonna assume that you know those relationships. So we talked about this. If a particle changes from moving to the right to moving to the left, so in our example, we actually change from moving to the left to moving to the right. But if you're gonna change from moving to, so actually try it, right? Like stand up, walk forward, and then you know walk forward, and then at a certain point decide you're gonna walk backwards. How is that gonna happen? What needs to be true? There needs to be one instant, instantaneous rate of change. One instant at which your velocity is zero. So we actually need, so we would need, here, um, velocity to have a sign change. And for velocity to have a sign change, we would need v of t to equal zero. Um, velocity is going to be differentiable. Like the derivative is going to exist at all points. Like it's, it, uh, things don't move. Uh, actually, this is not true. Things in my world don't move uh, in such a way that they could possibly have a non-differentiable position. Um, but I was reading uh, recently about Brownian motion, which you can look it up on, uh, I guess Wikipedia is probably a good thing. Brownian motion, I think, is non-differentiable. Like, uh, you can't predict where it's going to happen. And I cannot get my head around that. And it's been, like, weirding me out for a while. Uh, but anyway, for our purposes, uh, if velocity is going to have a sign change, velocity is going to be zero at some point. Uh, so there's a lot of information here. Let's actually go back up and see uh, where this t equals 2 came from, right? So we had s of t up here is uh, t squared minus 4t plus 3. So if s of t is t squared minus 4t plus 3, then the velocity which is s prime of t. So you're going to write that. And it's really annoying. It annoys me that you have to write that. But you have to write that. Uh, is 2t minus 4. Uh, so if v of t equals 0, you can see that t would have to equal 2. And then also, I mean, if you wanted to, you could uh, sign chart this. right? So here's 2. Here's v of t. We only care between 0 and 6 for like arbitrary reasons. But if you test a point between 0 and 2, like 1 in the velocity, you get uh, 2 minus 2 is negative, which means we're moving to the left. That's a convention. We'll talk about the conventions in the next video. And if you test something bigger than 2, you're going to get positive. So you can actually see that based on our sign chart, you're going to be moving to the left. And then at, after 2, you start moving to the right. And that's exactly what happened. All right, so I'm going to cut this video here. And come back in the next one. We'll talk about some conventions, some things like that. Uh, if you're unsure about like increasing, decreasing the relationship between a function, its derivative, its second derivative, uh, go check out notes 22 for math analysis. I think that'll be really helpful to you. And uh, yeah, just a lot of stuff. So make sure you know this, the position, velocity, acceleration relationships. And uh, we'll be back in the next video to do a little bit more. So I will see you there.